All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to our third talk in our 2020-21 speaker series from the Center for Criminological Research. Uh, you know, we're really excited today to have Dr. Martin Bouchard, uh, who is a professor of criminology at Simon Fraser University, where he leads the CAIN lab, the Crime and Illicit Networks Laboratory. His research focuses on the ways uh, in which social networks relate to gangs, how networks help understand the dynamics of gang violence, who gets into gangs, but also how they may help with gang exit. Uh, Dr. Bouchard works with a variety of government agencies and stakeholders interested in using network methods to reduce gang violence. His mentorship has been recognized with the SFU Graduate Studies Award for Excellence in Graduate Supervision. He is also the 2018-2019 recipient of the WSC Fellows Award uh, for individuals associated with the Western region who have made important contributions to the field of criminology. And today he is going to be offering a talk called Five Lessons Learned from Research on Prison Networks. So you know, without further ado, I will shut off my camera and I will, uh, I will hand it over to Dr. Bouchard. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Impeccable French, by the way. Merci beaucoup. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm assuming there's some some French background, um, you know, that we could uh, that we share. Uh, of course, I've been I've been 15 years uh, in BC right now in British Columbia. I left Montreal in 2007, um, but uh, you know, I do I do try to speak every day and, and keep my French alive as much as possible. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to present on this topic uh, on prison networks. Um, it's the first time that I present on this, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, this format and, and this version of the research uh, that I've been doing with colleagues and students uh, over the past five to six years. Um, so it's called Five Lessons Learned uh, from Research on Prison Networks. So I'm not going to present something uh, in, you know, one piece of research in detail. I'll provide uh, an overview now that we've published and we've worked on this for many years. Uh, you know, you get that sense and you get that distance from it where it's like, you know, you know what, we can maybe provide, you know, a few statements on, on what we learned. Um, that provide more of a bird's eye view, like an overview, uh, you know, of the whole program of research. And, you know, for people who are interested in prison and prison networks uh, and, and are starting perhaps uh, research projects these days, is there something that we can, we can tell them um, that could help? You know, is there, is, is there what is the interest basically in, in working on networks and, and having network data also as part of our portfolio of methods when we enter prisons. So this is the talk for today. Uh, and of course, we, it starts with incarceration as a turning point, a major, major disruption in the social networks of the people who are incarcerated. Uh, they have to leave their family, their friends. Uh, and, and this is the sort of uh, pains of imprisonment that we've been talking about, one of them, one of the adaptation to prison life in the literature uh, on prisons is, is to leave this family behind, these friends behind, and then being sort of forced to make new connections because these connections, these social connections are so important for human behavior, for human beings. Of course, we're gonna make and remake connections, um, but, but potentially with stranger, poten strangers, potentially with people that we would not have chosen. Uh, otherwise, and also we're doing and making these connections within an institution, an institutions with, with rigid rules where the loss of liberty is, is, is sort of the first, uh, you know, and foremost characteristic in terms of context. So it's a very different context than making connections, of course, on the outside. And so, uh, of course, that's what we're interested in. So how do they make these connections? on the inside. And there's a rich tradition in, uh, you know, of research in prison literature, ethnographic research, people observing, interviewing people who are incarcerated, trying to find out you know, the forces at play, the social informal hierarchy. And on all of this research, extremely rich uh, and, and, and informative. And, and perhaps the, the one thing that we thought was a little bit missing 
was to apply network methods in our study of social organization, try to make some sense in ordering and coding for the social relations that these inmates are talking about in order to perhaps test hypotheses and to go, uh, you know, and, and take some of these theoretically rich ideas from the ethnographic uh, work that inspired us and, and, and then coding for network data to test some of these propositions. Because there's a little bit of a mystery at the end of the day on um, what the whole unit or the you know prison networks look like in reality. And the different configurations that you know, these units can have can have consequences for victimization, for conflict, for the general atmosphere within these units, and uh, um, you know, violent behavior potentially, conflicts arising among uh, people who are incarcerated, but also with staff as well. So if you are in a core periphery structure, so you know, this is a sort of social structure that exists in society in general. Um, uh, you know, you'll have people in the center, in the core, that will be extremely important, you know, to, to the functioning of the unit. And this sort of run things, you know, if we find this sort of core periphery, they'll run things for the periphery uh, and, and be the sort of conduits and the brokers. Uh, if anybody needs something in the unit, you need to be connected and connect to the core uh, sort of before you get it. So that's sort of a theoretical, uh, I guess, structure that exists and then something that we can test once we map these networks. The, the units, the networks and the units can be fragmented, like people basically keeping to themselves or as small groups and not necessarily interacting as a group. Uh, or we can also find subgroup clustering. So not necessarily someone or a select few that act as brokers right in the middle of the unit, but mostly these subgroups that are related to a few different people that connect them together. So basically we didn't know, uh, and we had no way of um, sort of making proper predictions, uh, at least early on, on what we would find once we look inside and code for these social relationships. Um, there was some literature on, on you know, some network studies, including Moreno's sort of famous network study of, of you know, juvenile girls incarcerated in the 1930s, 1920s. Um, and so that was that sparked the first sort of uh, sociometry of networks. So mapping uh, an ensemble as subgroups of people interacting together. And, and it turns out that you know, social network analysis or sociometry was born uh, you know, in, in, a, in a juvenile institution in, in, in a, you know, for girls who are incarcerated. So you know, for our field, for, for people interested in, in networks, uh, this is what they look at, but for people who study prisons as well and networks, this is just an amazing little gem to, to find that study that, you know, sparked the whole thing, uh, the whole movement of, of social networks in general. So what we find here on the right is uh, the network of runaways. So the, the runaway girls, they're girls who, the 14 girls in a matter of two weeks who left their uh, housing units and ran away. And, and this is their networks of uh, attractive relations. So the people that they liked, you know, in their own house, which was the, the larger circle is a house and the girls within it, but also outside and across different houses. Uh, and what Moreno and Helen Jennings, uh, his, his collaborator noticed was that, you know, it was not necessarily the relationships within their housing that mattered but it was their relationships across housing that mattered because the runaway girls, you know, did not necessarily run away uh, with their friends that they had in their own house, but they did the same, they repeated or imitated the same behavior as their friends that they had in other houses. So there was this social structure of friendships across the houses and, you know, realizing it or not, these girls were basically imitating uh, the, the, the people that they knew also had run away. So it was a little bit of a, of a, of a surprise and Helen Jennings and, and Jacob Moreno uh, mapped these networks to try to understand you know, something that went beyond the personality of the girls and beyond their personal profile. It was something that was strictly social 
uh, and not necessarily, you know, in their immediate social environment in the whole, their own house in which they were housed, but, but it had something with their social relations in general across the houses. So that, that was the sort of mystery solved for Moreno that sparked the field of sociometry in general, um, you know, over 80 years ago. So using SNA in prison, we can do it in one of two ways, uh, or at least it's been done in one of two ways. Uh, you can use administrative records. You, to the extent that correctional officers write down a uh, summary or, or like a, you know, a journal entries of interactions of incarcerated people in their unit, you know, who sits at, at the table with whom, who seems to have a conflict together, who was involved in a, in a, in a victimization incident, you know, uh, incarcerated people A, incarcerated people B uh, were involved in an incident. If these records exist, and they do exist in British Columbia, where uh, I do research, um, and, and where Evan McCush, one of my colleague and, and collaborator on the Surrey 99 study, we were able to exploit these records of interactions among incarcerated people in order to recreate their networks inside prison walls. So that's the first sort of way an entry into prisons is that we can talk to people, but first we can also look at the records. And we'll see what kind of projects we can do you know, with either the records or interviewing people. And it's very different what we can ask inmates or people who are incarcerated and looking at their interactions from the point of view of correctional officers. We can do sort of complementary but different types of projects uh, using these data sources. And of course, we can ask people, as I mentioned, about their networks. And so the Prison Inmate Network Study uh, pins. Uh, if some of you have ever seen some of these papers, I'll talk about some of them. Uh, you know, this is, this is basically the main uh, method uh, with which um, prison scholars have used um, or, or have, have used or integrated network data in their research design to learn about the social organization of prisons. So I'll talk about that PINS study quite a bit today. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a picture of the original gangsters, the, uh, the OGs of the PINS team uh, when it was formed, like I, I think it was seven years ago at ASC. Uh, we had a dinner uh, where we all sort of, some of us sat down together and started to, to jot down these ideas of, of doing um, uh, prison network studies. Uh, and I like that picture. It cracks me up because of <laughs> how young uh, some, some of us are uh, in, in this picture. I was lucky enough to, to, to skip my, my own picture, but when, uh, when Derek uh, Kreger or, or David Schaefer or Jacob present and you see my, my little baby face from, from 12 years ago, that's, that's funny to them too. So, so yeah, these pictures from maybe 10 years, uh, 10 years ago for some of us, some of us maybe 15 years ago, look at Jacob Young here. Um, so, uh, so, so that's the original gangsters. And of course, tons of students, tons of research assistants came in some of them became professors uh, now, like Kim Davidson and, and Corey uh, Wichard. So um, amazing group of scholars, uh, you know, all of them have different sort of uh, areas of expertise. Uh, David Schaefer with, you know, longitudinal networks and uh, Ergams and Jacob Young as well. Sarah Wakefield on family relationships and release from prison and uh, so, so all, all of them, you know, different areas of expertise. And I guess my area of expertise was to be the, the sort of fellow token Canadian in the group, like to have that sort of different voice from Canada. It's like, no, this is not how it works in Canada. It's very different. Uh, so it was a great group to, to work with. Um, so which brings me to the five lessons learned. I don't want to take uh, too much time to, to make fun of, of these pictures. Uh, and just go straight to it. Uh, the five lessons learned from, from the sort of bulk of research, the first four are from the PINS project and the last one with the Surrey 99 study with Rick Corrado uh, and Evan McCush, my colleagues here at SFU. So the first one is that friendship patterns in legitimate contexts are generally reproduced in prison. So that was one of the open questions uh, given the, the sort of extreme nature of leaving the sort of free life and the loss of freedom that goes into um, the incarceration, obviously, you know, does it change dramatically the way that people connect? 
And, and the answer, you know, at least from, from our research on this is mostly no. Uh, these patterns in general are reproduced. So people form social relationships again, they form social relationships at the same sort of rate uh, that they do offline, the, the sort of preference for, um, or what we call homophily preference for people who are similar to us also reproduced uh, these patterns. Of course, you can ask whether these friendships are as close or as profound, as deep as the friendships on the outside. The answer is probably no. But do people seek and make connections? Yes, they do. So in the PINS project, the first wave, the very first one, we interviewed 133 people in a unit of 205, a good behavior unit um, uh, in a medium security prison in the US and Pennsylvania. So we interviewed 70% of the unit and we used a roster method, which means that we gave every, per, every, um, every resident of the unit a roster of the 205 people incarcerated with them and we asked them you know are you are you friends do you get along with this person and this person so we basically gave them the roster and asked them to you know check the box for each of the people that they are getting they getting along with and on average people got along or reported getting along with four uh, other people on the unit so for what we call friendships here in the context of prison, 98% of our respondents named at least one person. So maybe one isolate, one person said, I don't get along with anybody, but most people reported getting along with at least one person. This sort of right of getting along with people or four to five friends on average, similar rates to friendships in schools in other contexts as well. Uh, so that was a, our first sort of piece of the puzzle to say, well, this does not look so different than legitimate contexts and in institutions like school, for example, even in with adolescents compared to the adults that we were, uh, sur you know, surveying here well into their 30s uh, on average. The rates of friendship reciprocity. So someone saying that they get along. Uh, with someone else, when we interview that person, does that person also say that they get along? Uh, and 31% and rate of reciprocity, almost on par with the school friendship studies as well. Is, are people choosing people similar to them? So we studied a unit that was about 40% white, 40% black, and 20% Hispanic. Like if you look at the breakdown uh, of race ethnicity in the unit, uh, people were you know, identifying to different religious uh, beliefs um, so as well. Uh, people of different ages, we had lifers, we had people who were younger. We had a few gang members, maybe eight to 10, uh, depending on, on uh, the administrative records or, or their self-report. Uh, information. So friendship tie formation was driven in part with homophily, but the main story for us looking at this was that it's not as clear as it could have been. There could have been way more divides and hard lines between uh, people, but you know, basically what we saw is a mild to moderate preference depending on the race or ethnicity, but not you know, something spectacular or extreme. Like if you look just at the network on the right side of the slide here, you can see the coloring by race ethnicity. You can see the sort of mix, right? So if, if a node here, if a circle is closer to another one, it means that they probably have the same friends or that they themselves report getting along. So just the proximity of the circles gives us a, sort of a, an idea of what's going on here. There's, there's mostly a mix, even though we can see clusterization. Of course, with, with network analysis, we can quantify what's going on here and that's what we did so if you look on the left side here it's a fun little graph um, that is produced from from the regression tables that we had and uh, so you can look at the square here for race for example you can look at the diagonals you know and so this is a person for example who's white in the bottom left circle uh, the red circle that you see 
uh, is that person also connecting, uh, saying getting along with other white people? And so to the extent that it's a perfect match almost, you'll get a black circle. So the, le the, the more black a circle gets or the darker a circle gets, the more is there, the more we find perfect homophily, perfect matching between uh, someone's race uh, and, and the, I guess the race of their, um, of their friends in, in the, on the unit. So red for white, orange for black, and uh, for Hispanics, we have, uh, the, the, our, I guess, our only black circle. So it's not as strong as uh, it could have been. It could have been all black. Uh, it could have been way more, uh, way stronger. Same thing if we look at religion. Uh, again, look at the diagonal, uh, you know, as the main sort of takeaway here. Uh, you know, only one black circle for uh, Catholic religion. So other circles, way, way more, uh, way more complexity uh, in terms of the uh, cross-religious beliefs uh, than there could have been as well. Um, on the right side, uh, you have here the subgroups in, on, on the unit. So we used methods that are called community detection methods that are the same as cluster analyses, if you will, but for social network data. So to the extent that people connect strongly and they're really tight to a set of other people, then they will look like a community, they will look like a group, and they'll be extracted uh, by, by the, the using these methods. So we found eight subgroups in this unit of 133 uh, people. And the main story that we found here is the same, is that yes, there seems to be a preference for the same race uh, or same ethnicity within the circle. So you would see, for example, uh, you know, the same color in a circle and you have the composition of the race ethnicity uh, for each of the communities in the circle. What we see is a mix of colors. So even within the groups that we extract and are super dense and super tight, we find uh, that racial ethnic, ethnic diversity within the groups with some exceptions, but you know, that's the main story is for diversity for the most part. And when we look at ad health data with hundreds of schools, and some of them, of course, having the same sort of, uh, you know, heterogeneity in terms of race and ethnicity as we have, you know, a mix of black, white, Hispanic kids. When we look at these schools in particular, the students in these schools report uh, interracial, intraracial preference at the same rate as we found on the unit. So you can see the observed prison unit right on the regression line uh, for schools, for ad health schools, if we had to map their racial uh, preference given the sort of you know, ethnic and racial diversity that we have on the unit. So nothing necessarily so different in terms of the patterns found on the unit. So that's our first lesson. Our second lesson is that the social structure of prisons is remarkably stable despite high turnover, okay? So people who are incarcerated within these units change all the time. In the unit that we just studied, the 133 people that we interviewed, uh, you know, there were 205 on the unit in total and 63 people changed and were replaced in the course of the next four months after the interviews. So what we did is a wave two. We went back four months later and we found 63 new people on the unit. So a different roster entirely. And so we could make and design a study of the newbies, the newcomers on the unit. Where do they go? Okay, so what happens to them? How do they connect when they first join the unit? You know, let's say the lifers were there, they've been there for years and years, but how does a newbie cope and connect on the unit? So we took advantage of that second wave of data collection. I call this like a major shock to the community structure. Um, you know, and you could expect, for example, that, you know, as a newcomer, you'll connect to other newcomers. So that's a form of homophily right there, characteristics that are similar. And it's going to be maybe hard to integrate these social circles that are already formed with veterans on the unit, people who have been doing time for a while or who have been doing time in the unit specifically. 
um, and they may just keep to themselves. So that's what we ask, where do the newbies go? Do they form their own communities or do they mix with the oldies? And to do this, we did a little bit of the same thing that we just saw with the community detection. We extracted the subgroups within the unit in time one. And we repeated with the same method of looking at the interactions four months later in time two. So we used a, a method called Louvain, uh, community detection method that's trying to find these cohesive, tight subgroups. And if they are tight enough, then it will form and extract it, you know, as being separate and distinct to the others. And this is what we found here. Okay, so in blue, you have the breakdown of groups, of subgroups in the unit in time one. So we have, we found nine different subgroups using that method uh, in blue. And in time two, we found uh, 10 groups, so one more form. And it was a group, if you can see at the bottom here, it was a group of newbies um, who, who formed you know, in time two. So they arrived together. It, it, we call this a group, but it's a dyad. It's two people who just kept to themselves. They came in together. But for the rest, take a look, you know, look at the matching in terms of size, uh, in terms of the distribution. So even though we had 63 people leaving the unit, the changes in the size of these groups and the distribution of these groups is remarkably stable. So let's continue uh, and, and look, at, look at this further. If you look just at the network itself and what it looks like, you know, on the left side, top left, you have time one, bottom right, time two. It doesn't give you uh, sort of the full picture because we don't know who's who and, and which group is which group, but you can tell that at least the density uh, is about the same, you know, in each group. And, um, and, and now, you know, maybe with this figure, it's a little bit clearer what's going on. So the newbies, where do they go? You have the newbies all in green on that graph. So the blues are the oldies, the people who stayed from time one to time two. And then you have the green uh, people who are new to the unit. And most of them, of course, are on the periphery, right? So you come in on the unit, you cannot necessarily integrate easily uh, to the unit for the most part, but some of them do. Like you can see some of the triangles and circles right in the middle of this network here. But for the most part, you stay on the periphery. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you don't form, that you form your own group. It means that you're on the periphery of the group that you joined. So if you look at the wave two communities, here and you look at the percentage of newbies uh, in each of the group. Of course, you've, you have the dyad on the right side. Uh, that's 100% newbie. Uh, and on, but for the most part, you have mixed groups. So the newbies came in and integrated groups that were already existing. They did not necessarily form their own. Sometimes newbies are the majority, like you, you can see here in the middle. Sometimes they're the minority. Okay, but the fact is, is that the people in the unit welcome these new people and they also reshuffled their own relationships after people are leaving. So the relationships of the oldies are not necessarily stable themselves. So they reshuffle and make new friends, uh, uh, even within the people who are already there, because these people, the oldies, they're also evolving on the unit over time. Maybe they've been there now for six months, for a year, and they observe people and they may form new friendships along the way. So other research done by, by my colleagues, Derek Kreger and David Schaefer, published last year in ASR, show this specifically uh, in a therapeutic community. Whereas the newbies on the unit tend to use homophily as the first sort of matching uh, and integration, social integration on a unit. So they tend to connect with people who are similar to themselves. But as time passes, it's network processes that sort of take over what they call network endo endogeneity. So that transitivity. So if I'm friends with you and you're friends with another person, that friendship, you know, that we have in common, you know, will, you know, will produce a friendship of its own down the road. So transitive relationships, friends of my friends become my friends in the future. These phenomena tend to happen over time on the units as well, just like they do in uh, on the outside. 
So that was the sort of second uh, sort of lesson learned is that despite the turnover, the, the way that people tend to form subgroups in these units is remarkably stable. The sort of network mechanisms that lead to these uh, groups and subgroups emerging the way that they do, remarkably stable, even though the network mechanisms do not you know, operate in the same way for newbies, with, where homophily is really important, you know, compared to the oldies, the people who are on the unit for a longer time, where network processes, you know, network endogeneity becomes more important over time. So like transitive relationships, reciprocity, like these network phenomenon, for example, take over down the road, even though homophily still is important, other network phenomenon sort of take over for the oldies. So that's lesson two. Lesson three, now old heads dominate the status hierarchy in both men and women units. So of course we started the, the, the research in a good behavior unit. It's a men's prison, medium security. We interviewed these 133 people, but over time pins made babies, right? So there was uh, TC pins, so therapeutic communities that, that we studied um, usually with, with King David, Kim Davidson, who's now at FSU, uh, Florida State, being uh, an important um, person, data, you know, collecting data in these units. We also had uh, our pins, so being released from prison uh, and, and interviewing people who are about to be released and then asking them about their networks that they expect on the outside and then finding them four, six months later. And, and asking them about their networks again. Um, so that was one, one baby uh, of the PINS project. Uh, but another baby was uh, woe PINS, so women's prison and women incarcerated. Um, so, so this allowed us to compare whether our findings for the good behavior men unit that we had uh, was also found, these patterns and these uh, the social structures were also the same in, in the women's prison. So we'll see what we found in a slide or two. But for the first one, we had this, this study um, that, that we did about hierarchy in this unit. So instead of relying on the get along question, now we also asked the same respondents who are the most powerful and influential people on, in the unit and we also asked them, of course, why? Why do you say that this person is powerful? So you can see on the right side here of the network, uh, a much sparser network than we had before. It was very, very dense, a lot of subgroups, a lot of friendships, people naming on average four people that they were friends with. And now we have only a hundred people being named. Um, so half the unit is here and people name on average one person as powerful or influential, not four to five. So much sparser network. You can also see how concentrated the power is among four to five people right in the middle. So it's a much different, uh, different ballgame to speak of friendship and to speak of power. But it doesn't mean that they're not related. Okay, so if you name someone as powerful, we also found that you are also likely to get along with that person. So it goes hand in hand. Among your four or five friends, you're likely to name one that you consider to be powerful or influential. And, and so that seems to be the, the dynamics that we found. So it's not that power and influence are unrelated to friendship. It is related to friendship, but it's just that not everyone is considered to have power and it's only a filthy few that do. So uh, old heads prevail. So older people on the unit received more power nominations. People who receive power nominations also tend to receive get along nominations. So they were popular on the friendship side and they were also deemed to be uh, powerful and influential. And of course the question is why, why these people, what's special about them? Uh, so in that unit in particular, we had age and time in, uh, sort of wisdom, prison wisdom as the main thing that people were saying. So he knows prison, he's a lifer, lots of time in, he's an old head. So that's an expression that they were using themselves. Uh, he understand how prison life is, how things are run. 
Uh, you also notice sociable and positive personality. And so at first we were surprised by this. We were expecting gang members or people who were convicted of violent crime to be, to be running things, but maybe it was the good behavior unit, but we found sociability, positive personality, trustworthy, humble, respectful. Okay, so respect was breeding respect on that unit uh, very much. Teacher role models, sort of, sort of mentorship narratives uh, came out as well. So very interesting uh, findings. So we continued, uh, uh, you know, the, the PINS project getting to women's prison. Uh, it's a paper that hasn't been published a long, you know, too long ago, looking at women's prison and comparing our findings. We had not just one unit for women, we had three units. So we had the same sort of good behavior units, uh, but one was minimum security, the other one was maximum security. And uh, we also had a general population unit uh, with women. And, and the main story of power uh, for, for the women's prison is the same, that uh, old heads, people who were a little bit older tend to receive more powerful power relationships. Uh, getting along uh, is also a thing. These people are named more often uh, as friends. But something new that we found in the women's prison is the sort of negative or bully personality uh, that was never mentioned as is, you know, uh, in, the, in the men's unit. People, when they talked about negative relationships or negative leadership qualities, they talked about um, fearing that person, that that person was, you know, think he's all powerful, but he's not. So different ways of, of defining a negative uh, relationship. But for women, the bully or negative personality, those are the words that they were using uh, to describe some of the leaders. So they were not necessarily naming, you know, influential and powerful people that they liked themselves. Uh, you can see here on the right, uh, on the right side, this network is, you know, the, the, the size of the circle is based on the amount of power nominations that these women received and the composition of whether, you know, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the ties that they received. So is it a neutral, a positive uh, tie to them or a negative, uh, like a bully personality? And you can see a little bit of red here and there. You can see that people who are important on the unit were controversial. So they were Im very important and positive role models to some, and it almost created this in-group, out-group uh, situation where for others, they were perceived as being bully uh, and negative. So people acknowledged, these women acknowledged uh, that this person had power, but they didn't like necessarily what that uh, person was bringing to the table. Another uh, thing that was different is, the, of course, caregiver and emotional provider roles that we didn't find in men's prisons, but we found in women's prisons, uh, in women units. And, and of course, we speculate in, in the paper about, you know, of course, the gendered responses to the pains of imprisonment. Um, you know, maybe the loss of family uh, is, is more of, a, of an important uh, turning point. Uh, for, for women also trying to reproduce uh, or being a little bit more vulnerable to, um, to reproducing these, uh, these social relationships inside prisons, like a little bit more of an importance also put on these social relationships. As you can see as the number one um, factor here in, in the unit, in unit number three, which was a general population unit, uh, sociable and positive personality, which we find in both, but was more important for women in that case. Uh, than the men's unit on the right side. This leads me to the fourth uh, lesson learned, and it's a quick, uh, I guess, a click, a quick um, shout out to one of the research assistants and PhD students who worked um, his ass off on, on this project for years and years. He's now at University of Albany, assistant professor. His name is Corey uh, Wichard. Uh, so social networks can be used in planning a crime-free release from prison. So it's the RPINS component uh, of the project with Sarah Wakefield uh, at Rutgers University being very important uh, co-PI uh, in, in this project and Corey Richard being one of, uh, of the collaborators on the project person doing a lot of the interviews and who did his PhD uh, with this aspect of the project being center, central. 
So this is his picture here, uh, Corey. Um, um, amazing PhD, amazing piece of research. I hope you have a chance to read his papers or they're gonna be coming out, um, I'm assuming the next months or years, but uh, using networks to plan a cram-free prison release. Uh, so Corey and, and Sarah and others sat down with people who were incarcerated, people from the first unit, the 133 that we talked about, the people on the unit who were about to be released. So there were a few people who were one month to a few weeks away from release from their correctional file. So these people were interviewed and, and Corey and others sat down with them and asked them to try to imagine their networks on the outside. So if you know you want to you know, be crime free, so who do you have in your life? Who are you going to connect to uh, on the outside? And so ego is the, the incarcerated person uh, they were interviewing, you know, telling, uh, telling Corey or, or Sarah or others or uh, Michi, uh, Michelle Sawyer about um, their family. So of course I'll reconnect with my wife, I'll reconnect with my father, with my mom who's in a separate network because they're separated, uh, my kids for some of them, uh, of course, but also their friends, their old friends. So you can see here that you can represent uh, and also ask the, the, the person, the, uh, the respondent, uh, the interviewee, uh, you can ask whether that person is gonna be a good, positive, pro-social influence or a negative, uh, potentially a negative influence getting yourself back in a, a life of crime. So by seeing the network, trying to think through the, the, the risky situations from a people's perspective, people in their life that tend to bring maybe these situations to the forefront, uh, trying to, to, to make them think a little bit more deeply uh, about, about these potential risks. And so, so that's a beautiful piece. Um, and I don't want to, to, to show too much here, but it's just I just wanted to mention the idea uh, because it's a beautiful idea that, uh, that they had um, and that they did. And then meeting with them four, five, six months later and asking like, so did you reconnect with your dad the way that you thought you would? And did you reconnect with your old friends? And, and in many cases, uh, it was very different. The reality of going back on the outside and who you are going to connect to in reality is very different than what they expected in good and bad ways. So I know some of them did not reconnect with family the way that they thought they would. Uh, and they did you know, connect with new friends also that they could not, of course, have planned before uh, and maybe new sources of influence, uh, you know, good or bad. Uh, so a beautiful piece of research, but I want to mention it as, you know, something that we can do as well in thinking about release from prison uh, using network methods, but in a different way, a very personal sort of uh, also creative way, uh, I would say, to, to use network methods. And our final one, uh, the social networks built in prison feed co-offending in the community. So if you're not planning a crime-free release from prison, you're gonna go back to a life of crime and the people that you're going to commit crimes with, maybe people that you were coming, co committing crimes with in the past before you were incarcerated, but it could also be people that you met in prison that you see on the outside again. And this is especially the case for uh, juveniles, for adolescents who are incarcerated and, and they're coming back in the community and they, they're coming back with after a short time in a juvenile institution sometimes, and, and that juvenile institution is in their own community. And then they meet these people and they would have no way of knowing that person. They don't even drive yet, uh, but they can use the SkyTrain or, or the Metro or, or the bus and then meet with them on the outside even when they live in, in different cities. So we looked uh, at this, but from the perspective of the administrative records. So instead of asking people uh, about their contacts in prison. We used administrative records of correctional officers uh, talking, uh, you know, did about the daily routines of the people in, in a unit, but also merging this with records of co-offending and co-arrests and co-conviction uh, in a case and what we call the community, the community network. 
So I'm doing this with Evan McCush, Rick Arado, colleagues at, at uh, SFU. Uh, we selected, because we, we were working with the city of Surrey, which is a, one of the major you know, suburban towns around Vancouver, 500,000 people uh, live in Surrey. Um, so they were interested in understanding their population a little bit better including their gang population. So we looked at a long-term, uh, you know, it's been, I think, 20-something years that uh, Ray Corrado started this project uh, of interviewing uh, adolescents who are incarcerated in BC. And so we looked at those, uh, who, uh, those, those uh, incarcerated adolescents who were either active in that city uh, or were living uh, based on their records in that city. And we just extracted them and looked at their trajectories. So everything in their career, uh, every interaction that that could be uh, that could be extracted from the community. So the co-offending, the co-arrests from the time they're 15, 16, that they're incarcerated for the first time and they enter the study and then followed up till they're you know, 30 years old, 15 years later. So we had like a long, like 14 to 15 years on average that we could follow them in the community. And we also had, at least for a short time frame, their interactions, their social interactions in prison. So victimization incidents involving two people, uh, conflicts uh, involving two people. So a fight broke out and we have the names of these people in the records. So we, we connect them together, uh, but also social interactions, pro-social in the context of prison. So who sits with whom at lunchtime, uh, who's with whom uh, for certain activities. We also had that as well. So when we look at the community networks, so what happens outside of prison walls, we find a mostly fragmented set of different networks. We, we say here we have 32 components, which means we have 32 disconnected networks, including a major connected component, main component right in the middle. So mostly disconnected, but some of these kids who were not necessarily chosen because they were co-offending together, they were just chosen based on their participation in, in a research project, and they happened to be living in the same city. And so most of them, uh, you know, working in, independently, were, and, and some of them indirectly connected together in the middle. So very sparse, disconnected network. And what we find about these youths when we look at their prison interactions can be seen on the right side here, they're all connected. Like even though we picked them just based on the city that they lived in, once we looked at their incarceration experience, they tend to be all connected together. We go from 32 networks, all fragmented, to three different networks, including a major, major one uh, where most, most people can be found right in the middle. So. In order to make sense of this, I'm, I'm going to, to reduce the size of this and just look at one aspect of it. It's a project by Krista Dawson, uh, you know, part of her PhD that she finished recently. And so we're writing, we're writing a paper these days, but she looked at a prison gang. So a gang that formed in prison while these adolescents were incarcerated. So the orange circles that you see on this graph uh, are the gang members. They did not necessarily know each other. Many, most of them did not know each other prior, but they were incarcerated at the same time. So they formed that prison gang. The green circles were collaborators in the gang. So they were not seen as gang members, but they interacted with them so much that it's almost like they were part of the gang. And all of the others are people who, who didn't seem to be, I guess, tight enough with them to belong to, to a subgroup but they were contacts and, and people that they interacted with in prison. So this very tight network around a prison gang, this is our observations from the inside with people who did not know each other. So they were all islands on the outside. This is what happened when we looked at their community social interactions after incarceration. All of a sudden, it almost looks like the prison network reproduced. So they connected on the outside. They met in prison, they collaborated in a prison gang. And for many of them, at least five members of the, of the eight out of eight of the prison gang reconnected uh, on the outside, including with some of the green collaborators, as you can see uh, on the left side of the graph. 
So these connections that they make in prison feed their community, uh, you know, co-offending. So their crime-free release, their the promises that they make to themselves, uh, to others, um, sort of influenced by by what happened during their incarceration experience. And so if we never connect the two, if we only have either prison research projects and community research projects, and we can't connect the two somehow, we're going to miss that part of the puzzle that the two are uh, you know, related and closely related. So that's our fifth lesson, okay? The two are related, one feeds the other. Which brings me to the conclusions and just to stop this before I go past my, my allocated time, but uh, network data both confirm well-known findings of this prison uh, literature, this rich ethnographic tradition, looking at the pains of imprisonment, including some from the Alberta project. Uh, and and I, I think I, I read recently one by Haggerty, Kevin Haggerty and, and Sandra uh, in Incarceration Journal about the, the new pains of imprisonment as well and the pains being uh, you know, experienced disaggregated, experienced differently depending on uh, the person. So we found this also in the WOPINS project, uh, women in, you know, experiencing their social relationships and the power uh, relationships differently than men as well. Um, but we also, I think, I hope, uh, found a few new things and a few uh, areas of research that could not have been uncovered without systematic coding of these relationships. And we were also able to test some of these ideas, these hypotheses from uh, the ethnographic tradition. So, so I hope you, know, you can see uh, that the two can go hand in hand uh, and, and work together for the future. We also found that, that people who were incarcerated were willing and able to talk about their social relations, but there's a limit to this, right? So when it was time to talk about victimization, conflicts, you know, or illicit trade. We didn't ask people, you know, in, in Surrey, BC with my colleagues here, we used administrative records in order to get at the illicit trade, the co-offending inside, but also the conflict, the violent conflicts on the inside. So you cannot do everything, of course, with a single set of methods, but in combination, potentially you can get, um, you know, at the bottom of the research questions of interest uh, that you have. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you uh, for, for inviting me. And, uh, and I hope we have some time for, for questions and I didn't go too, too long. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bouchard. I uh, really appreciate that talk. It was really enlightening. Um, so just to give uh, Martin a chance to catch his breath, I will just very quickly say, and then we'll, we'll move over to questions because I think I see a few people uh, do want to ask questions here. Um, that we are not having a talk in December, as you know, I think we all need the break, and and usually things in December are not that well attended at universities. Uh, but we will be back in January. Oh, I forgot to check the date here, but on January twenty eighth, um, and we have Elaine uh, Hishka. Uh, from the University of Alberta, and she will be doing a talk on harm reduction. So I will be sending out an announcement for that and watch our, our social media as well um, for announcements on that. I think it'll be a really good talk as well. So now, yeah, I, I just want to open things up. Um, anybody who has questions, uh, you know, you can just raise your hand in the uh, on Zoom or type them into the chat on YouTube and uh, or if you prefer not being on camera, you can just type it in the chat on Zoom as well, and I can read it out for Dr. Bouchard. Um, Will, Will, I knew you had a question because I saw you turn your camera on really quickly. Go ahead, Will. Uh, thank you so much. Really interesting uh, presentation. I'm really, uh, I mean, yeah, these are things, as you say, we, we know a lot of this, but just seeing the way you've mapped it out in this brilliant work, really enjoyed that. One question I had uh, specifically related to your first point around race clustering and how it sort of reflected a lot of the same sort of things we see in schools. Now, one of the really big themes that have been coming out, uh, especially around like research on prison codes is sort of this increasing focus on race governance in prison. I'm thinking things like uh, Scarbeck's The Social Order of the Underworld and some of these other ones where race is really being held up as the primary tool to understand prison codes and prison organization. Now. 
I know you're looking more at the social networking as opposed to the code sort of thing, but um, it, that sort of seems to contrast some of what you're finding here. So what, what do you think, or do you have any thoughts kind of about those factors? It's a great question. You're right. Uh, it does contrast uh, with Scarbeck's work quite a bit. If you read Scarbeck's uh, first book uh, on the social organization of prisons in California, you would imagine that it's all race, all gangs too. And it's all you know criminal governance, basically. And it's the same with us. Like if you just read our work, you're like, you know what? You know, the race is, is not a, that, that big of a deal. Where, where are the gang members? They're nowhere to be found. Right. So so you have I think you have the two extremes of, of two different situations and contexts that produce very different outcomes in this place. So I don't think we can generalize from Scarbeck's work. I don't think we can generalize for our work. Like even when we went into women's prisons, we went into maximum minimum security general population. But but we didn't go uh, in California. We did where, where the gangs and, and the power relations can be very different. Uh, either so, so I think that's still an open question uh, for for all of us. Uh, maybe we got lucky slash unlucky uh, in in the type of units that we were uh, analyzing. And among the group, we ask these questions to ourselves all the time, like how come we find gang members to be so unimportant uh, in this? But they're in the minority, right? So we have only eight uh, to ten out of two hundred. So first, they're minority. They're also from different gangs. So, and, and by gangs, we also include, of course, right-wing extremists and uh, anarchists. Uh, so all kinds of, of gang members. So not necessarily uh, the, the expected ones, but I think when you get into a prison where, in a, a unit where fear, uh, fearing for your life and your, and your safety uh, becomes the major issue, not a good behavior unit, but you know, a, a more general population unit potentially, then you need to make decisions on who you're going to connect with that whereas homophily and, and and that's the first signal race right the first signal so i don't know anything about these guys uh but we seem to recognize ourselves at least superficially at first based on that race signal uh and, and that may be the only decision that you can make like the, the amount of agency that you have in this context may be very very limited uh compared to the good behavior unit well you know you can sort of almost seek the good you know the good people uh, on the unit and align themselves, align yourself with them. So, so I think it contrasts, you're right, but I think we're both analyzing uh, maybe, um, maybe not ex two extremes on a continuum because I think you know, it's probably very common where, where gang issues are common. Like even in British Columbia, when I visit the institutions here, some of the units uh, have a majority of gang members and there's tons happening <laughs> on this unit and and if it's not race homophily uh it's going to be gang homophily so which side of the conflict do you align yourself with um and of course correctional you know uh, administration tend to try to separate you know these gangs that are but but it's not always easy and they don't they don't always know people don't always self-disclose uh, their their gang uh, leadership or, or their gang affiliation uh, to the, to their detriment sometimes. Um, so so no, I agree. It's a, it's still a very open question. Uh, so I think we found something that aligned with schools so well because the the climate of the unit uh, felt safe, uh, like a safe environment. And, and in that case, homophily plays a role because it's human nature, but it's not the only and the prime factor driving the whole thing. Um, great question. Thank you very much. And I, as you spoke, I was thinking of Michael Walker's race making uh, article that came out a couple of years ago, which reflects almost exactly what you're saying, like what, what sort of other features around the institution are, are fixing this, but thank you. So. So, so we are at 1.30, so we've been here for an hour. Uh, do you want to take a couple more questions? Uh, yes, yes, chat? yes, yes. Okay, I perfect. Chat. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, read this one out from Ashley. She has two questions, but maybe I'll just read the, the first one uh, to start here. So uh, she says, thank you for your, your talk. Um, do you imagine there is or have you found distinctions between federal and provincial prisons? In other words, do you imagine length of stay would have an impact on network configurations? Yes, great Canadian uh, content here. Uh, great question. I, I think it would. Uh, the type of unit, for example, that we had with the, the lifers were present. Um, 
I think help create, especially if the lifers are good people, sociable, uh, the, the, the people that, that tended to be, to be reported to be sociable and friendly, um, you're, you're more likely to find them in, in of course, if they have time, uh, you know, if there are lifers, if you are in a federal institution. So absolutely, uh, the units that we were studying in BC were uh, juvenile institutions, so high turnover rate. Um, people know that they're not there for a long time. They won't be there as an adult uh, either. Um, so I think it would influence um, the types of findings that we find. And I'd be very curious to test it out uh, systematically. Uh, just looking at the women's prison, the, the general population uh, units, uh, there's, you know, the power dynamics were also a little bit different, uh, a little bit more of a turnover than a good behavior unit where you have to prove yourself to, to be admitted. Um, uh, so, so absolutely, that's a great question. I would be uh, so happy to test this in Canada uh, with that question in mind. Okay, and I, I guess for Ashley's second question, uh, did you find any distinction between individuals incarcerated for the first time um, from those who've been incarcerated previously? For example, individuals new to a unit may have been incarcerated at that institution numerous times in the past, which would impact baseline network connections. Yeah, great question, uh, uh, Ashley. It's almost like you read uh, the footnotes uh, of some of the papers uh, uh, because it, it's it's hidden, you know, inside of our of our papers. But we mentioned this uh, at some point in, in at least one of them uh, that the difference between the newbies who make it to the center, uh, and and it's the same in therapeutic communities is the links from prior incarcerations that they have with current residents. So of course you can jump the line uh, when, you, when you have that connection. And the other aspect of this is the cellmate. So who are you bunking? You know, who, who's your cellmate and, and, and what's the status of that cellmate can also uh, facilitate your integration and, and perhaps increasing the speed at which you integrate to the center to the extent that your cellmate is himself herself uh, connected in the center. Um, so people that are completely new uh, have less power. And, and if you come in with experience and age, you're just new to the unit. You're, you know, the people that we found in this situation were likely to know people enough uh, on the unit to have some connections that allow them to integrate a little bit more easily. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. People, the younger people were uh, almost always at a disadvantage uh, in, in all of the units that we had, but the older people new to the unit were not necessarily uh, at a disadvantage. Um, so great question, yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. And this looks like it might be our, our last question um, from L'Oreal, one of our fabulous grad students. Um, Ashley is also a grad student who's also fabulous, but I didn't say that for her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she says, a really interesting talk, Dr. Bouchard. I'm wondering, what does having quantitative knowledge of prison networks do? That is, how can this type of knowledge be used to inform policy and practice, you know, quote unquote, on the ground? Uh, you talked a bit about how it might be used to identify pro-social family members and friends of incarcerated people upon release, but can it be used to inform policy and practice in any other ways? Yeah, no, that's a, it's, it's a big one. It's a big question. Uh, a lot of the uh, of the rationale for the PINs projects and the coding of the network data was to test theoretical questions, you know, about, about prison, but also, uh, you know, from the inside, some of the grant applications and some of the projects had a very practical component. And I'll give you one example uh, with therapeutic communities, what we call TC PINs. TC, the TC philosophy is, is didn't need any network you know, knowledge or network quantitative analyses to be built. It's built on the fact that we want to create one big family of big brother, little brother that you know, support each other in, uh, in trying to, um, to work through a substance, a substance use disorder. Okay, so addiction or, 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 or any sort of these issues. So people who are incarcerated, who uh, tend to score high on, on, on these scales, uh, could apply to be part of these therapeutic communities. So one of the ways in which, uh, and, and one of the sort of vagueness about therapeutic community and that people don't know without quantitative 
methods is, is whether it works the way that it was intended. So in terms of assessing the impact, so you can have stories and, and narratives of people who swear by the TC uh, unit that they've been into, and you can have people who say, well, it did nothing for me. Uh, but the one thing that we were able to do was to systematically look at whether it functions as one big family. We were able to count uh, and, and to, to know exactly if the big brother were talking to the little brother, you know, people in phase three, were they integrating the phase one people, are the phase two people right in the middle? And, and, and the exceptions, the people who are not uh, working, who are they? What do they look like? Uh, and where do they fit? in the network and what kind of outcomes do they have themselves. So by systematically classifying uh, in that way, we were able to test, you know, a sort of an old question about TCs. We found that it was indeed close to one big family. It was hard to separate subgroups and the subgroups that we were, you know, able to separate fit with the TC philosophy of the mentors taking on the newbies on the unit. So uh, you're able to, to sort of uh, find the, the sort of candidates and sort of quantify it that do not work within the system uh, really well beyond the impressions um, that you may have. So that's one thing uh, that, uh, that these things can do uh, for you. That's one of the examples. Uh, and of course, the others, when I work with, with correctional uh, administration, it's about allocation. Uh, of, of people who tend to work well together uh, to create and produce less violence on the unit and less violence towards staff. So the recording of past conflicts systematically in order to avoid future conflict on a unit. So that's one other sort of practical uh, consequence. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for, for answering those questions and going you know, about 10 minutes over time. Um, so, and thanks again, that was an awesome talk and I think a really good way to end the, the 2021 portion of our, our speaker series. Um, so as I said before, we are, we're gonna be back in 2022 in January, um, on the last Friday of January with Dr. Elaine Hishka um, talking about harm reduction. So we hope you will all join us for that. Keep an eye on our uh, social media. Uh, so I'm gonna end the stream here and anyone who wants to stick around and chat with uh, Dr. Bouchard while he has time, I can do that free of, of being on YouTube. All right, and the stream is done, so.